Well, good morning. Good morning. So welcome to the second day of our Data Summit Conference. In case you were not here yesterday morning, uh, my name is Mary D. Ojala. I'm the conference program director for this conference and some other ones that information today does. I'm also the editor-in-chief for KM World Magazine, editor of Online Searcher Magazine, and I moderate webcasts for DBTA and for KM World. Um, okay, who in the room learned something new yesterday? Oh, that's what I like to see. Lots of hands raised. Excellent. Excellent. So I want to remind you that the exhibit showcase does close today at 2 p.m. Um, we will have lunch in there. We will have the morning coffee break in there. But you only have until 2 o'clock to check out our wonderful sponsors and exhibitors in there. Uh, just a quick program reminder, uh, the first session in the AI and machine learning track, that's the one that's all the way down the hall that direction, um, that is uh, talking about bridging the gap between data and the real world will be given by Bharath Vasudeva from Quest. Um, B202, unfortunately we have had to cancel because the speaker from Wells Fargo could not make it. And finally, um, if you like this year's event, you can mark out the dates on your calendar for next year's event, which is May 14th and 15th, 2025. Amazing, we're almost into 2025. So I would now like to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Beth Rudden, who's an established IT leader. She's got some expertise in digital transformation, cognitive science. She founded BAST in uh, 2022, after a very successful stint working for a company you've probably never heard of, IBM. And she is also the conference chair for the Enterprise AI World Conference uh, that will happen in Washington, D.C. in November. Um, she has some patents. She's written a book, AI for the Rest of Us, which I have read and is excellent. Thank you. Um, and she's got degrees, believe it or not, in classics and anthropology, an obvious fit for the AI world. So, Beth, take it away. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me here to talk about mastering the data evolution, AI, graph modeling, and tactical curation. Before I begin, I want to let you know that all of my slides come with a reference page, so sit back, relax, enjoy the show. This picture is by Tom Cowie. Anybody know what this is a picture of? Yes? That's right. It's called crown shy, and it's a natural phenomenon, and trees leave space in between where you look up through the trees and you can see this pattern in the sky. And what it does is it really lets sunlight reach the seedlings in the next generation of trees. Today I'm going to take you through a journey, a deep dive action, uh, called action and a conclusion. I'll make sure that you guys know where we are every step of the way. Let's start with the story at the root of the issue of AI that is used to make decisions about people that lacks transparency. Once upon a time, in the late 2018, news broke about a biased Amazon recruiting model. Amazon set out to revolutionize their hiring process by introducing an AI system to streamline online application reviews and aim for efficiency and impartiality. It's actually built in 2012. Trained on a decade's worth of resumes, predominantly men, reflecting the tech industry's gender skew, the AI inadvertently learned to devalue cues related to female candidates, such as involvement in women's chess clubs or possibly belonging to the Girl Scouts. This lack of transparency compounded the problem, and the opacity made it very difficult for them to debug and understand what was going on, which is why it took them six years to take it down 
after a lot of, of people saying you should take that down. By the end of this talk, I want to convince you of one thing, and it's a better way to do AI. I believe that adding version data and ontologies, which are also graph models, to explainable AI can revolutionize how we interpret AI behavior, transforming it into a transparent process that invites user trust by demonstrating how evolving knowledge shapes AI decisions. But first, a word about edamame. <laughs> I just finished reading Brene Brown's latest book. It's in my reference page. And she has a story in there that I wanted to share with you guys. So she went to her new fancy friends when she became a professor with her husband. And she walks in the door. And she is given a bowl of edamame as an appetizer. And she goes, oh, are these beans I need to shuck? Here, let me go to the kitchen for you. The hostess was floored that Brene Brown did not know what edamame was and proceeded to tell all of the guests, did you know Brene Brown didn't know what edamame is? She was mortified. And this story stuck with me because that shame of not knowing is something that has driven me my entire career. And I am now doing work with educators, with teachers, <laughs> with lots and lots of people who I believe need to be a part of AI, and they are afraid to ask questions. So one promise to you, my email address is at the bottom of any of these slides. Anybody has a question, let me know. I've been writing NLP for 20 years. <laughs> I'd love to talk about it. And my job is to try to explain it in ways that everybody can understand. In order to get a representative sample of AI in humanity, we need about 20% of 8 billion people. That's 1.6 billion humans writing and understanding how to create or grow their own AI. All right, let's start with a point of view. Anybody know what this is? That's right. Writing, so Plato wrote down what his teacher Socrates was saying and wrote down the allegories in a book called The Republic. Socrates was against writing. He thought that it would not allow people to have dialogue and create critical thinking skills. Sound familiar? He also thought that when written history it would allow ideas and stories to be recorded accurately without relying on memory. So from the perspective of the prisoners in the cave in Plato's allegory, the entire understanding of reality is based on the shadow that they see on the cave wall. These shadows cast objects that they can't see and they become the version of truth. An ontology is literally the branch of philosophy that is the study of the nature of your reality based on the language that you use. It's also known as a knowledge graph, but we'll get to this in the deep dive. I want you to think about how the language we use to describe our reality or our own mental model would be similar to the prisoner blindly accepting that the shadows on the wall was the reality. Second piece of very important information. Data is an artifact of human experience. Somebody either created the data or created the system that creates the data. Reimagined for AI, Plato's allegory of the cave is when the AI system's outputs are blindly accepted and act as puppeteers. The shadows are filtered and curated representations of the world that the AI system is choosing or making the output for. All right, let's talk about our current reality. Let's start with where we are. Many of you might be surprised to know that this latest revolution started only four years ago with conversational AI. And the reason is, is that we had a societal revolution that was just starting if you go back to the first industrial revolution, we saw the introduction of the factories, which started moving jobs from the farms 
to the factory. In the second, mass production in the assembly line and automation. In the third, our first understanding of using automation in order to be able to do digital transformation. Sorry, in the third, automation. And the story I love to tell, it's really quick. In banks, the ATMs freed the tellers up from handling cash. And what happened is the tellers created relationships with people who started to trust the banks and put more money into the bank. Banks grew, jobs changed. In the fourth, the digitalization. And note the spelling here. Digitization is very different than digitalization. Digitalization is the process of automating processes <laughs> and using digital data in order to help people understand. And the fifth, this era of personalization is exactly where we are right now. The promise of AI is hyper-personalization. In order to understand that promise, I believe that everybody has to create their own. This is my history. <laughs> and one of the things that I really like to, to show people is that what we are doing right now, many of us in this room have been doing for a pretty long time, and that's understanding language. So Tim Berners-Lee, in 1994, 30 years ago in Boston at MIT, created the W3C standard, or the World Wide Web Consortium. He used entity extraction in order to get entities and their relationship into an ontology also known as a .owl. When I was starting and I started understanding that you could put entities and their relationships into an ontology, I, we, we started with dialogue flows and we started with Q&A pairs. Now the Q&A pair I found really interesting because we would have to go to IT and say, could you give me 100 variations of this question? Give me 100 variations of this answer. IT didn't know crap about the business. Could be argued that they still don't. <laughs> From there, we really went to knowledge-based conversational AI, where we were hooking up knowledge graphs in order to ground the context for natural language understanding. NLP has three different areas. You have natural language understanding, natural language classification, which is your prediction, and natural language generation, which is all the rage. So in 2015, 16, Andrew Ng figured out that you could use GPUs or graphical processing units in order to get machines to learn 100 times faster. This started the entire machine learning era and what it did is it really allowed a lot of different people to be able to put whatever they wanted into a neural net or into the 400-ish statistical models that are there and have the model guess the feature. And they didn't have to curate the data. They could just shove as much as they wanted to and then be able to look at the accuracy of the model, even train other models to revolve through which model is the best model for the problem. This is machine learning. And the thing that we have with large language models is a form of deep learning, which comes from machine learning, neural nets, and transformer architecture that is, is created from these G, the, the GPT or generative pre-trained transformers. It's the same concept except for bigger <laughs> and a lot more compute. So they have statistical qu quantity as opposed to semantic quality. Mm. The big thing about these big models, going back to my tree picture at the beginning here, they take a huge amount of compute. All the electricity in New York City for one month for one model training, or 15 swimming pools full of fresh water. What we did in BAST is we took something that we loved, the Provo ontology, and we remixed it and we made it relevant for today by understanding how to use an ontology to ground context so that we can understand what the person is saying and use that for explainability. All right, so we've heard, who's heard the Sorcerer Apprentice story? Anybody? Who knows that that dates all the way back to ancient Egypt? 
we've had this mythology of human beings where the sorcerer leaves the apprentice in the workshop. The apprentice is like, I got this. I can do this. I'll just use my magic to get something else to help me clean up all this mess. We know the story, right? I think that when we understand that the inputs are large quantities of data that we may or may not have had consent to put into the neural nets, not curated, not understood, not well-ordered and labeled, or well-ordered and labeled by a machine, or people who didn't understand the problem that they're solving, this is what generative AI is, input, black box, output. In order to explain it, you gotta stick another black box on top in order to extract the features. Some people can do RAG, or retrieval augmented generation. Add in a vector database where you're vectorizing every single little bit of your data and then use the RAG to retrieve it. Same thing, input, black box, output. I've done numerous talks, and this is the best way that I can show what is going on. And this is Llama. Because it's open source, I can look to see what the predicted next token is. And what's really interesting about this is if you look at anything that is in the red words over there, that was not the highest probability. Somebody came in and made choices in order to create a AI system that seemed more personal and more human. Everybody's heard of personification. <laughs> this is an example, and it shows, instead of saying, I am, it gives you a contraction. And this contraction makes it more personal, makes me, makes me and every other human want to anthropomorphize the AI. All right, let me give you a little bit of the envisioned future. This comes from Amy Webb's South by Southwest talk. Has anybody seen this in the room? This is a phenomenal YouTube talk. It's out there, it's amazing. She gives so many reference points for what I'm about to tell you. It blows my mind. So right now, today, this is the worst that the technology will ever be. We are, on, we are in the middle of that spiral. <laughs> it's going really fast. And she talks about people are either ostriches or scramblers. I don't want you guys to be either. I want you to be informed. And what she says is that there are three things that are converging in order to get to that 5.0, that personalization. And she says, those three things are artificial intelligence, connected ecosystem of things, and biotechnology. This talk is absolutely amazing. And what she says about artificial intelligence is the command line will be our brain, will be our thoughts. In the connected ecosystem of things, right now we're going to run out of data to feed the neural nets in about two years. So every single company is scrambling to get devices on you so that they can collect more data. Vision Pro, it actually is measuring the size of your pupil and how it dilates. We will, using connected devices, be able to predict behavior. So we're not just gonna have large language models that predicts that next token and that next word, we're gonna have next action models we can predict behavior. Biotechnology, this one, I am so glad. One of the taglines I built for BAST in 2022 is grow your own AI. And I've been trying to figure out how to really get that in because it's an instinct that I have. I believe that people have to trust the system. In biotechnology, they're called organoid intelligences. They are growing brains from human cells that act on biology, which has a very different process for learning than machines or statistics or even semantics. OK, let me give you a happy story, 40 seconds. <laughs> Imagine you're seven years old and you go to Ep Epcot. You've got the geodesic dome in front of you. 
Buckmeister Fuller, <laughs> his dream, and you walk up to that dome and you put your hand on that dome. And you imprint all of the things that you are thinking and feeling and understanding from that day. You go back when you're 12 and you have a conversation with yourself because you've left a graffiti on that geodesic dome. And you have the ability to understand that in Kissimmee, Florida, it was really hot that day. <laughs> and you can feel that, 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 that smog, that heat. We are going to be inhabiting artificial intelligence. It will be a part of us. It's up to us to grow our own. Let's do a deep dive. Let me start with some key concepts here. Artificial intelligence. I want you guys to stare at this Ben <laughs> while I tell you a story, because <laughs> this is, I, I use this every chance I get, because a lot of people throughout my lifetime, and I bet yours too, have told you, well, it's not really AI. It's just machine learning. It's just a regression. All of these things make up what goes into artificial intelligence. In 1956, Marvin Minsky got all of the smartest people in the world, and he wanted a diversity. And he got them into Dartmouth for a couple days, and he got psychologists and anthropologists and doctors and lawyers, and he wanted that diversity of thought. Guess how many women were invited to that conference where he coined the term artificial intelligence? Anybody? Actually, one. His wife was there to cook and walk the dog. <laughs> artificial intelligence simply is a system that simulates, capable of simulating human intelligence and thought processes. This is artificial intelligence. This definition is what I use, and I am an anthropologist, and I define my terms. All humans are biased. Who's seen this? Anyone? Cognitive bias codices, it is 188 human biases and counting. These are not explicit. We do this unconsciously because we have paleolithic bodies, medieval systems, and godlike technology. What should we remember? We discard specifics to form generalities. <laughs> Last night in conversation, I think we said the word gross generality at least twice. We need to act fast, to be confident, to seen as confident. We've got to scramble. We've got to keep up. We've got to get the knowledge. We've got to get more. This is a bias. Not enough meaning. We simplify probabilities and numbers to make it easier to think about. A really great book is called Annie Duke's Thinking in Bets, and it gets you to start to understand probabilistic thinking, because what people don't get is that there is a form of error. It's the Bayesian error or the least amount of error that you want the system to make. And the question that everyone should ask is, what does that error look like? What does that 0.0001% look like? So when it is wrong, what is it, what's happening? How does it impact the person? Too much information, big, huge sigh. Who has felt that they have had too much information stuck in their brain in the last year? We are drawn to details that confirm our existing belief. All right, let me go into ontologies. There are different flavors of ontology. What my team has found is that we can use an ontology for explainability because it carries metadata in a way that no other thing can. It's really, really handy. You can stuff a lot of metadata into a very small ontology. But we also need a formal knowledge graph in order to organize data. So you need two, at least. And you need multiple ways to build ontologies. When we started this, we knew that we could use ontologies for explainability and then use natural language classification, and natural language understanding, and natural language generation. 
Remember the, the IT people who had to create the generation by hand? What we did not really understand is that in order to build an ontology to solve a problem, you gotta know what user you're augmenting, what problem you're solving, whether that data can be extracted, use named entity recognition into an ontology and then used for context so that you could use that context to solve the person's problem. Classically, ontologies are structured knowledge. They provide structured framework to represent knowledge within a specific domain. Any formal ontologist looked at my ontologies, they would puke. <laughs> we do things that you're not supposed to do because we're using it to explain. There's only one other company that is doing that, and that's Palantir. And they use ontologies for rules where we use ontologies for explanation and understanding. AI systems that use ontologies can leverage logical reasoning to make decisions. This is concept hierarchies. We can more, all of this can be explained. You know that something is a part of something else. You can use ontologies to explain why the AI system is giving you the prediction that it is with full lineage and provenance. Here is a picture of the page with the paragraph that was used to predict why, why I gave you that prediction or why the AI system gave you that prediction. Here's me clicking around <laughs> in an emotion ontology. And when I built this, I did not really recognize. We used um, the big five personality and we used the Likert scales in order to understand the variance. And when I read Brene Brown's book about emotions and giving people language, most human beings only have five words for emotions, which is a feeling that you feel in your body. That's why you call it a feeling. And I was floored because the difference between being sad and being nostalgic, the cultural variation with traits, <laughs> the understanding between behaviors, traits, and emotions, this shouldn't be secret knowledge. This is, this is what we should be allowing people to understand. We use this ontology to build over a million personalities in order to test and predict how people are going to react to AI systems outputs. Who's heard of versioning? Anybody built a multi-dimensional data warehouse and had to version all the data in order to get back to that data set that was used in order to create that training data? So versioning is really hard. If, if Tim Berners-Lee and Marvin Minsky, maybe they might have invited a woman, you know, we, could have, we would have a very different World Wide Web or a very different internet if versioning had existed because it gives attribution, something we desperately value. Version data allows for the historical tracking of changes made to data sets used by AI models. This traceability can help explain why an AI model, AI model made the decision at a specific point in time. Based on the data, it was trained or used for predictions. Input, black box, output. In our world, what we do, we take your data, we put it into a system of record, a registry system, and we use DVC, or data version control, which is an excellent open source system. It's the back end to GitHub. And it's an old school registry system. You don't need internet connectivity in order to create data producers and data controllers. It's very cool. We use an ontology as a map to understand that system of record and give people the ability to place anything that they need, and then retrieve anything that they need from that system of record. We only use large language models to generate variations and to enrich the data. That's it. All right, let's review. AI is a simulation of human intelligence and thought processes. There are 188 cognitive biases and counting. Ontologies for explainability are in addition to the knowledge graphs that organize information and version it. Versioning 
is the traceability and replicability. Is it science if somebody cannot come and replicate your results? All right, so I really wanna kind of bring this to a couple different scenarios. And we are using, BAST is involved in several different systems, but these were the easy ones. <laughs> I, have, I have been after this ability to give people language and use ontologies as Rosetta Stones. So a mom with four kids under 10 has conflict resolution as a skill. She has negotiation as a skill. She has all kinds of things that are, are not known to her potentially, and she needs to go out and get a job. Using an AI system that can teach her why she has supply chain skills, because she knows how much peanut butter is in her pantry, that's powerful. Teaching a kid why they might be feeling nostalgic instead of sad, that's very powerful. Using AI as a Rosetta Stone using ontologies as a Rosetta Stone democratizes knowledge and teaches people why. And it is in this why that we can then start to see things from different realities, different ontologies. So this mom might take her newly formed resume, smash it against an ontology of a data scientist, and the, that ontology and that AI system will say, you know what? Here are the skills that you already have. Here are the skills that you need. Here are the classes that you can go get to be, go get that job that you want. On the employer side, I've said this for a while. I think that the male and female parts of business are broken. The employers right now are using keywords or concepts or worse. They are adding so many things to jobs that it makes it impossible for people to be able to meet that. And the HR people, it's a cost center in an organization. They don't have money. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have the, the knowledge or the information of what is going on in IT. They don't really necessarily understand all of the skills that somebody is needed, and they are the ones in charge of writing the job recs. If you use an ontology and versioning, you can do that continuously where you tell the HR person, hey, these people already have sent OS. Oops. <laughs> these people already have sent OS. It's a operating system for Red Hat. Let's go make them Red Hat administrators. Or these people understand Linux. Let's go make them get into Python. They won't know this unless they have a system that allows you to continuously change and continuously evolve what's going on. Here's a concept for you. Data is a flow, not an event. So systems that are pre-trained, do not have feedback mechanisms, do not version that feedback, cannot easily be retrained you need to continuously flow your data over your models. Okay. Has anybody had an intuition about how somebody is feeling on the other side of the world with a single digital response? Raise your hand. It's magical, isn't it? Anybody said this to a friend? The connected devices thing. There's a really great book. Um, it's called uh, Techno Feudalism. And it talks about the feudal lords that are in our world today that is collecting a lot of this information. I used to say, you know what? This was back in the early 2000s. I'm like, they'll never, I, I've, I've organized data. They'll never figure out systems to organize that data well enough to understand what's in it. <laughs> yeah, I was wrong. Um, has anybody had to forcefully put their phone away or put their device away because it was making them sick? Outrage to engage cycles. 
we have paleolithic bodies, all of those cognitive biases that I talked about, I really want people to understand what is at stake. Without transparent inversion data, humans will continue to solely rely on information that confirms their existing beliefs. We were not meant to know what is going on in the world all the time. We were not meant for the 24-hour news cycle. We were not meant to have such FOMO about what was happening in another conference at another time. We just weren't meant to. And what's happening is that when, um, I always tell this, I love this one, a peer of mine, Jennifer Goldbleck, gets up on the TED stage in 2013, and she says, I can predict whether you have done drugs with five of your Facebook likes. Five. When you have massive amounts of statistical data, you can predict something about an individual human with a little, 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 little amount. And that is what's going on, but we can do the same thing using high quality, good data, especially if we start to train people in the conversation about the sorcerer's apprentice that I told you about last time, optimism bias, we have this sort of, op I, can, I can tell you, I would love to get into this optimistic point of view of where AI is going. I love this optimism bias. I use that, but in the sorcerer's apprentice and why it dates back to ancient Egypt is because we have, we have done this story before. And I will, I will give you a little bit of a conclusion at the end here. But I think that we need to make sure that we understand that we are repeating these same stories. And um, another great conversation that we had last night was about when people are going through a liminal stage or a transition, like puberty, teenagers, there is a, they think differently because their bodies are biologically imploding. And I think that, you know, my body is biologically imploding as well right now, going through women transition uh, more, than, more than men, which is why we don't have a lot of medical data. But all of these biases, implicit bias, all of these things will perpetuate and exacerbate our desire to make sure that we are reinforcing a societal bias. And some of the societal biases that we are reinforcing through the use of artificial intelligence and worse, being used to control how people are engaging with artificial intelligence through social media, through all kinds of different systems. This will continue unless we demand lineage and provenance. We demand why was that AI system created? Wait. You created general intelligence because you thought general intelligence could solve everything? Anybody seen this wheel? This is one of my favorites. Um, so Sylvia Duckworth is an excellent educator in Canada, and she created this wheel of power. If you're on the inside of that wheel, you have the most power. I am neurodiverse. I identify as autistic and ADHD, and I am on that outside with one, well, two of those pies. I cannot imagine people who are on that outside of that wheel and how different their perspectives are. I remember when I first had an Alexa, and I would have to lower my voice because it was trained mostly on men's voices, not on women's. When you are on that outside, part of that wheel, you have a perspective that is a superpower. You can see how these AI systems are just codifying our past and amplifying all of the implicit bias or the societal bias that we have. One of the best things that I ever did for my data scientists was stick them with a bunch of the designers and say, you know what? I want you guys to predict who gets in a lifeboat for the Titanic data set. They were floored, not so much, but they understood that a human being or a guy in first class would get in that lifeboat before a woman and a child in steerage. That is a societal bias. 
188 cognitive biases and counting. Okay, so you have to be part of the ecosystem in order to change it. Here are some questions that you can ask yourself or your AI provider or ChatGPT Anthropic Perplexity in order to find out how you too can build an AI system in this way. And what we are not doing yet, we need robust systems. <laughs> we don't need systems that are brittle. We need systems that have the test, retest, reliability that can be replicated, because it is science. Adding version data and ontologies to explainable AI can revolutionize how we interpret AI behavior. It can turn into a transparent process that invites users' trust by showing how evolving knowledge shapes all AI decisions. For this myth to end well, and it is a myth, um, we as information scientists, ontologists, taxonomists, adults in the room who understand the value of, and process of learning, understanding is a labor, not an act, it takes work, we should not leave the apprentices alone in the workshop. We need to be participating in AI. We need to be part of that 1.6 billion people. Our young people will inherit this worth world that we leave behind. I would love for you guys to join us. Well, thank you so much. That was invigorating. Um, we are now going to do a quick switch of computers and mics as we get ready for our second uh, keynote speaker this morning, uh, Lalit Ahuja, who is the Chief Technology Officer of Gridgain Systems. He's responsible for the direction, implementation, and delivery of Gridgain's technology strategy. Um, in his career, spanning over 25 years, even though he doesn't really look like he could have possibly been working for 25 years. Um, he's got a bunch of IT functions, including enterprise architecture, product management, large-scale program management, IT operations. He's basically done everything. I'm not going to read the rest of this. Um, and he does have a degree in engineering and an MBA from UCLA. So we'll get this up and running. Momentarily. Momentarily. 